Hey there and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld Ice Sheet Survival Series. In the last episode we started our research on mortars, Cambia also got sick with the flu, and most importantly we also got attacked by a group of centipedes. With careful tactics though Cambia survived, and so today we pick things back up right where we left off last time. And with Cambia asleep, the troubles out on the ice sheet don't stop. We now have another sickness to add to his already existing one, as Cambia catches some fibrous mechanites. Now from the last episode he already had sensory mechanites, and while the fibrous mechanites once again do have some advantages, they also further increase his pain and his tiredness. Just like the sensory mechanites, the disease is not deadly, and it can be treated fairly easily, at least compared to some of the other sicknesses in the game. Still, those two together will cause Cambia some serious discomfort. Especially the tiredness is going to be a huge problem, as it will drastically reduce Cambia's productivity. Still, there is not a whole lot we can do about it at this point, and since Cambia does not have to stay in bed for the few hours that he's not tired, we might as well get some work done and have him repair the base. Afterwards we can then continue researching, the mortar project is already more than halfway done, and as I said in the last episode I would like to complete that before we jump onto hydroponics. Apart from researching and resting not much else happens for the rest of the day, until just a few moments after midnight Cambia gets inspired. For the next 24 hours Cambia will now walk faster, which is actually kind of useful because the fibrous mechanites increases walking speed as well. And as you can see here in Cambia's stats overview, they also increase quite a few other skills. Shortly after, we then received the inevitable ransom offer. I think it was in episode 19, when we once again failed to save a refugee from pirates, who then took her away with them, and who are now asking for a ransom to release her back to us. And as usual, we are going to reject the offer, I don't really want her back anyway, and we also don't have the money. The next 24 hours then remain fairly uneventful, Cambia loses his walking inspiration without getting much use out of it, and with a quick look at the huskies we can also see last episode's food problems are back. So we once again have to give the huskies access to the human meat storage, even though the reserves in there are not spectacular either. Luckily though, our food problems could solve themselves just a few seconds later. We get another call for help by a refugee who's being chased, and since the chasers are tribalists and not pirates, I think we are going to help out. A tribal raid should be something we can deal with even if it's pretty large, and we always have the backup option of letting the tribalists get away with the person they want. That person in this case would be Artyom, not the most interesting colonist, both incapable of violence and research, and also once again running around the ice sheet with nothing more than a pair of pants. So it remains to be seen whether or not he actually makes it back to the base. At this point, however, we are interrupted by Ruby, who has given birth to two husky puppies. So we now have five huskies out on the ice sheet and we're probably not going to keep all of them, and we're also going with a slightly different naming process this time, but we will discuss that in a moment. For now, we have a raid to focus on. Archam Turner here by the way, also a luciferium addict, so that might just allow him to reach our base before collapsing due to hypothermia. If he does not make it though, chances are not looking too bright for him, because this right here is the group that's on his heels. I am not quite sure I count about 19 attackers here, yes quite a lot of them only have melee weapons, but we probably don't want to leave the entire thing up to our defenses. So with Cambia we now keep the assault rifle equipped and we'll have him walk over to the switches to turn on the turrets. I was briefly thinking about using one of the centipedes miniguns for this, but those have a very slow recharge speed and they're also pretty inaccurate, so they are not necessarily ideal for the whole hit and run tactic. So Cambia moves out and Archer moves in, however only up until the end of our trapped corridor. Surprise, surprise, I once again don't really plan on keeping him, and the end of the corridor there, that is in my opinion the best point to leave him. The attackers will still have to fight through a large part of our defenses to get to him, some of them will very likely trickle down into our base, and when they then eventually decide to capture him again, all of that happens right in the middle of our defenses, and I think it will be a lovely chaotic scene. 
With Cambia, meanwhile, we take our chances. We have decent cover here and can take a few shots at the attackers. However, we also don't want to stay in their firing range for long. They do have bows and most of those outrange the assault rifle. So we just want to land a few hits and then move Cambia back. Right here in the corner, he can then land a few more hits. But once again, we're not going to risk anything here in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Instead, we now move him back behind our first line of defense and see what happens. Archum, by the way, has already gone down to hypothermia, so realistically, he wouldn't have made it much further anyway. We also get the message the tribespeople don't even see him yet, but they are apparently close enough to decide on their strategy. But let's see how many of them go down in an attempt to recapture the refugee. Alright, the bulk of the group has now made it into our traps. The attackers had quite a few losses already, and here we are now with the first of them actually entering the base. This will of course now prompt the crossfire from the turrets and Cambia himself, who is safely hidden at the far end of the turrets. And this right here, this scenario is now exactly what I hoped for. Most, if not all of the surviving attackers are severely injured, a few of them actually got into our base and immediately got slaughtered, and the remaining few are now escaping. Cambia, meanwhile, hasn't caught a scratch yet, and can now fire away at the retreating attackers who try to dig their way out of our defenses. One more enemy falls, and this guy prompts the retreat for the rest. A retreat that is, for the most part, already in progress, however. Still, with some of the enemies injured and likely slow on their feet, we send Cambia out on the pursuit. After all, every single corpse here is a source of human meat. And look here, Cambia actually manages to quickly shoot down another attacker. And let's have him go for one more. Maybe we get lucky and can down the enemy before he reaches the end of the map. Alright, it was a close call, but eventually Barracuda here got away. Still, I'm more than happy with how the whole affair turned out. We can quickly kill the enemy next to Cambia here. And then looking at the carnage in our base, we should have about 10 more enemies down or dead here. So Cambia returns to the base with the first bit of loot, and before he heads off to bed we want to take care of at least the supplies that are unroofed at the moment. Their selling prices will drop if they deteriorate too much, and that would be a shame. Speaking of trade, at night then, while Cambia is asleep, we have a trade ship passing by. And even though most of the valuables from the raid are not in our storage room yet, let's have a quick look at what's for sale. Alright, there's really not a whole lot that interests me here. We do have the Scyther Blade, however, that we can sell for a decent amount of money, but that is also the only transaction we make. On the next morning then, Cambia begins the repairs. Our attackers left quite a mess here. Our defenses have been breached at several points. The walls have taken quite a bit of damage, and we should of course get all of that repaired quickly. Another priority are no doubt the corpses. We currently do not have a single unit of meat left in storage. The huskies have actually started eating some corpses, which is of course less than ideal and wastes precious resources. With most of the corpses in the storage room, we can now also reconstruct the walls that have been destroyed. We can also see a small breach here at the top near the convenient choke point. That needs to be repaired as well, otherwise we lose one important strategic advantage. On the next day then, the final day of winter by the way, it is butchering time. Our colony has zero food reserves at the moment. Like I said, the huskies have already partially consumed one of the corpses, so Cambia needs to start chopping, at least until we have enough meat to serve us for a few days. Four corpses later then, we take a break from the butchering. After all, the majority of our traps are still disabled, and that could cost us dearly should Randy Random decide to throw another raid at us. So we will rearm those, but thanks to his sickness, Cambia is once again getting pretty tired, and so after finishing the rearming process, we send him off to bed with a major break risk. Hopefully, things look a bit better by tomorrow. Cambia's well-earned sleep, however, is once again interrupted by a trade ship, so let's have a quick look at what they have to offer before they leave again. Alright, starting us off here, we're going to sell a few leathers that we don't really need, mostly because we only have low quantities of them, but in the case of the human leather also because we have just way too much. 
We also stay consistent with our no drug policy, and that means we can sell both the smoke leaf joints and the luciferium. As usual, we will then also sell off the dead man's clothing, but once again, that doesn't make us a whole lot of money. We do make enough in this trade though to buy something, and the choice was very easy here. Food is of course our number one concern at the moment, and so we spend a bit of cash here and buy 600 units of elk meat. In the early morning hours of the next day then we can see Cambia haul the elk meat into the husky stables, and it is now officially the first day of spring, so winter is behind us, temperatures will rise again, we can probably get rid of the heater soon, and all in all, life out on the ice sheet should become a bit more comfortable. After a quick rest around noon, Cambia then continues butchering. After all, if the huskies now have plenty of meat, Cambia shouldn't lag behind. That pretty much also wraps up the day for Cambia. In the evening then, his tiredness once again gets the better of him, but thankfully, at least for the moment, our food problems are solved. Now at this point, as promised, I also want to quickly discuss the naming process for the two new huskies. Since we have two, we can mix things up a bit, so one of them will get a name that is randomly selected from my list of patrons. I think that is a fair privilege for those of you who chose to pledge. The other name, however, will be selected in the already familiar process. Simply leave a comment with your idea for a name down below, and I will randomly select from all submissions. On the next morning then, we reorganize things a bit around our power supplies. Right now, pathfinding is a bit of an issue, because Cambia always has to walk over the solar panels and the round the wind turbine in order to reach the switches for the battery and the turrets. For that reason, we are now going to deconstruct that wind turbine, and we are rebuilding it in a slightly more convenient location. Now it will no longer be in the way, allowing Cambia easier access to the switches, which of course also increases our reaction speed in combat. Now, however, we have to put down a few conduits to connect everything, but it's not an overly long connection, so security-wise it doesn't pose too much of a risk. The next few hours are then spent with hauling. We have human meat, human leather and dead men's clothing to store away. A bit later we can also see Cambia do a bit of cleanup, and then after a few hours of sleep he returns to the research bench. The mortar project is coming along nicely and should be finished within the next few hours. First of all though, we have a small gift from Randy Random. A snow hare has self-tamed, and well, it is the ice sheet, we don't have much food, so we are going to slaughter it immediately. And yes, I realized it would have been more efficient to just wait for the snow hare to enter the base. Instead, Cambia now makes his way out on the ice sheet and takes care of business out in the open. With the snow hair corpse in the storage room, we continue with research. Cambia, however, once again has to take a rest because of his sickness, and so it becomes late evening out on the ice sheet when Cambia finally finishes the mortar research. As expected, this now allows us to build a mortar gun, and after Cambia has gotten a few more hours of sleep, that is exactly what we'll do. Now, just like the gun turrets, the mortar can be built from various materials, and also just like with the turrets, I have chosen plasteel. A plasteel mortar has almost three times the amount of hit points compared to the normal steel version, and since mortars have the rather annoying habit of exploding when they're too damaged, a good amount of hit points is always a good decision, especially considering how much plasteel we still have in storage. To the left of the mortar you can also see Cambia has constructed a sandstone shelf, and that will now be used to store the mortar's ammunition. A mortar has to be reloaded after every single shot, and it uses special mortar shells to fire, and of course you can imagine how tedious it would be to always run back to the storage room to rearm the thing. So the mortar shells will be stored right where they're needed, and the shelf will make sure they do not deteriorate. Now we are also further securing the mortar with a stone wall, that way it cannot be hit by enemy fire coming from the entrance of the base, while the mortar itself can lob its shells over the wall without any problems. And yes, as you can see, the range of the mortar is pretty damn long. It cannot hit close range targets, but apart from that, the range extends across the entire map. Now that spring is upon us, I think we can also safely switch off the heater in the husky stables. It is warm enough outside for the huskies to feel comfortable, and that way we can save a bit of power. 
Now that we have a bit of downtime, we can use that to take care of the mechanoid corpses we have. The disassembling procedure will once again give us steel, plus steel and components. The centipedes give twice the amount of the scythes for all three materials, which is actually quite a bit with 80 steel, 50 plus steel and two components. While we're at it, we might also quickly butcher the snow hare. It won't produce a ton of meat, but our huskies are hungry, and they are eating through their reserves with impressive speed. This, by the way, might also be a reason not to grow too attached to the two new huskies. Of course, I don't want to make any promises, but they might not stay with the colony for all that long. On the next morning then, after a bit of cleanup, it is time for more research. And yes, we have now finally reached the point that I think many of you have been waiting for, as we start researching hydroponics. Now, in theory, hydroponics are a very cool thing. They allow us to grow crops inside and very quickly. However, those crops also need a sun lamp to grow. The whole setup consumes a ton of electricity, and a power shortage in the hydroponics area will very, very quickly kill your crops. At this point, though, I think we have the necessary power supplies in place, so let's see if we can start to become a bit more self-sufficient. By the way, I have also ordered Cambia to start trading the third husky. Biscuit here will now also learn how to haul, but just like with his parents, that will probably be a rather lengthy process. That phrase pretty much also describes the next two days. Apart from researching, resting and occasionally training the husky, not much is going on. And so we are slowly but steadily reaching the end of the episode. However, before we wrap things up, I think it's time for your Patreon shoutouts. The early support on Patreon has been amazing, and like I said, I will name a husky after one of the 28 patrons we have so far, but I also want to say thank you to every single one of you. So let's get started with Wade B. Crane, Gero Knob, Autumn Mamrak, Frederick Elledge, Julian Link, Eric Steele, Michael Helquist, Shane Thacker, Brian Miles, Ginate Marie Alice, Anth Hopper, Alistair Marno, Kim Lupai, Jimmy Rustler, Roddick New, Brian Goodman, Gerno, Michael Talpers, James Mack, Jesse Austin, Marine Morell, Joshua DeGrasse Baumann, Tara Cimino, Samuel Wenzor, Oscar Kjellberg, Liam Nordel, Trent Doyle, and last but not least, Nathan Moore. A big, big thank you to all of you who support my work. And at this point, we also make the cut in today's episode. Next time, we will then likely start with the hydroponics. Until then, as always, leave a thumbs up if you liked the episode. And if you want to support the channel, then you can either subscribe if you haven't already, or you can support the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.